bring more weapons. That was the chilling text message the attacker in Nice sent just before he began his murderous truck rampage along the shores of the Mediterranean, striking right after a Bastille Day fireworks display ended. He killed more than 80 people before he was stopped about a mile after he began. How can we protect ourselves from future attacks like this? Joining me now are Peter Bergen, CNN's national security analyst and a vice president at New America. And from Normandy, Nathalie Goulet is a member of the French Senate and the vice chairwoman of that body's Foreign Affairs Committee. Uh, Madame Goulet, can you explain what are the lessons that France, that French authorities are drawing from what happened in Nice? Well, I think that's the main point and that um, we, we cannot predict everything. And, you know, what happened in Nice was not predictable at all. And I think that it's a very challenging time for the politician. And um, we, we have to keep um, our head on our shoulders and try to weigh the investigation. And it's very, very difficult because the, the people now, they are very angry and very sad. And it's a very, very difficult time that we are crossing. Peter, um, when, when Jake Tapper asked uh, John Kerry about ISIS, uh, they got into an exchange where uh, John Kerry said, look, ISIS is on the retreat. Uh, it is losing territory. It is losing finances. Uh, and Jake Tapper said, yes, but it doesn't appear that way to the public because of these terror attacks. And the Kerry says, well, you can't. These are lone wolf attacks. Uh, who's right here? How to, how to think about this issue? We do see ISIS on the, on the retreat in the Middle East, and yet we see these kinds of sporadic attacks. Well, of course, they're both right, because uh, both things well, are simultaneously you know happening. Um, we, we've seen ISIS lose up to 50 percent of its territory in Iraq and 20 percent in Syria, and yet at the same time, uh, ISIS has directed or inspired attacks uh, across the West, um, and these things are happening simultaneously and will continue to happen. Uh, Madame Goulet, yeah. when we think of France, we think of the French counterintelligence has always been very good and, and, and very tough. Um, they've, they've uh, you know, people in the American intelligence community always praise French counterintelligence. Do you think anything more can be done uh, when you look at something like this to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future? Uh, uh no, no. I, I think that, of course, crossing intelligence. But you know, uh, the murder from um, the murderer from Nice was not on the watch list. It was not known. It was just it has a kind of high speed radicalization, which is a new way. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure. Sorry, it was so much connected with ISIL, unless by the social network. And I read what your other guest wrote and ten things that we have to do. I think that we we have to work a lot on the social media. That is really important because this propaganda is a nightmare because this guy was just uh, unstable, you know, and, and uh, he was a madman. And then he catch some of this uh, propaganda and here we are. So I, I think that we have to disconnect a little bit what happened in ISIL on Iraq and Syria and what happened on the field, especially because we have a lot of people radicalized in France, more than 10,000. You know, we have more than 10,000 young people on the verge of radicalization, included 40 percent of convert. We have 40 percent of this 10,000 Christian convert into Muslim for the sake of radicalization and fight uh, with ISIL. So, you know, we have to think about all this issue. Peter, why do you think this is happening uh, in France? Uh, you know, n n not to single it out, but there do seem to have been a series of attacks in France, and it does seem more prone to have these radicalized uh, loners than, say, Germany, Italy. You know, one doesn't know for sure, but certainly the evidence of the last five years suggests that, there, that France may have a special problem. And I would add Belgium, and it seems to be a francophone problem. I mean, Belgium has had the highest proportion of foreign fighters by population uh, going to Syria. Uh, France has had the largest number of uh, Western, uh, any Western country of uh, going to Syria and, and joining ISIS and other militant groups. And uh, the fact that uh, something like 60 percent of the French prison population is Muslim, and yet only around 8 percent of the entire population is Muslim, reflects the kind of marginalization and criminal nature uh, the, of, uh, of this problem. And if you look at all these attacks, Fareed, uh, one thing that invariably ties them together, including the Nice attack, 
is that they've either been involved in petty crime or have spent significant time for serious crime in French or Belgian prisons. Um, Madame Goulet, yeah, that, that, how, how do you solve that problem of alienation or marginalization? You know, not, not ever to say that it justifies any kind of terrorism, but is it part of, is part of the solution to deal with this alienation? Oh, absolutely, because, you know, we have a, a breach of the citizen link. Those people are not feeling themselves as a French citizen. They don't recognize the Republic. And the problem we have is that they are children of the Republic. We are not talking about the guy of yesterday, because the guy of yesterday is another problem. You cannot put in on the watch, you cannot put all those people on the watch list. I mean, they are, he, he had no previous link with terrorism before the day before yesterday. And that is a, is a real problem. But for the other one, the people on the verge of radicalization and also the people who are going to be back from Syria and Iraq, we are going to have a serious problem and we have to work on it. It's also a question of discrimination. Uh, it's also um, a problem of international um, um, policy how they felt, and it's also the problematic of the secularism in France, you know. We are, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, military secularists, and that may create uh, the feeling for the Muslim that the French law is against Muslim or against Islam, and that is also a problem. Peter, that's a very important, interesting point, and I'm, I'm uh, fascinated to hear Madame Goulet make it. France has this very aggressive form of secularism, far more aggressive than the United States. In the United States, for example, a woman can wear whatever she wants, but in France, uh, certain kinds of religious garb, uh, Muslim veil, are, are not allowed. Is it your sense that that provokes, that, that makes this kind of alienation worse? Well, you know, this is uh, an, an idea that's been around since the, the French Revolution, the idea of what the French call laïcité, which is a sort of secularized uh, society and state. Um, but I would add, to, I think, to that point that there is no French dream, there is no British dream, there's no German dream, there's certainly no EU dream. Um, and there isn't the ideological apparatus in any of these European countries to encourage uh, large-scale immigrants uh, to feel that they're part of the nation. And that's not particular to France. That's true across Europe and in the United States, the American dream has been something of a firewall against these radical ideas amongst the Muslim American population who are on average as well educated, as well integrated into American society as any other immigrant group uh, that has preceded them.